Hi, everyone, um, and welcome. I am Andrea Lips, a curator of contemporary design here, and I am honored to be sharing the stage tonight, moderating this conversation around materials and technology with three of our National Design Award winners. So by way of very brief introduction, um, sitting to my left is Neri Oxman, who is our National Design Award winner for Interaction Design. Neri is an architect, a designer, an inventor, a professor <laughs> at MIT, the founder of the Mediated Matter Group at the MIT Media Lab, um, and that is a design practice. It really integrates computation, digital fabrication, biology, material science, and much more. <laughs> really seeking and um, exploring the transformation of our relationship of the built and the natural environment. And next to Neri is Mikyung Kim. McYoung is our National Design Award winner for Landscape Architecture uh, and is the founder of your studio, McYoung Kim Design, which is based in Boston, a landscape architecture and urban design firm, um, where you very much are, of course, weaving nature and sculpture uh, and a lot of the work that you do uh, to solve urban resiliency issues with a deep connection and commitment to placemaking. And finally, Christina Kim, who is our National Design Award winner for fashion design. Christina is the co-founder and designer of DOSA, uh, which is a clothing, accessories, and housewares company that focuses on rethinking conventional fashion production and sustaining artisan cultures. So thank you to each of you for being here this evening. Um, and I really actually wanted to start out with a question to you, Mikyung. Um, as a landscape architect, how do you define a material in your, in your practice? That's a broad question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good question. Um, can you guys hear me in the back? OK, great. Um, so I think. Um, the difference between design and landscape architecture and the two other kind of brilliant work that's flanking me is that I think um, we actually work with the materials of the natural world. Um, sometimes when I'm in an argument with architects, I say, if you look up and you can see the sky, that's our realm. <laughs> and so um, it's al always about the materials themselves that often come or always come from the natural world, depending on how how uh, how much it's actually transformed. But it's also about um, highlighting the systems of the natural world, so the materials actually show us how they change. So, um, like Christina's work on the body, our work is with the systems of the natural world. Our materials, in general, we don't. Our our practice is quite resilient, so we don't go into a project saying, "We are a firm that uses stone," or "We are a firm that uses stainless steel," but that we we listen very carefully to the community and the site and the systems of the place to understand that. And so, an example is um, a healing garden we did in Chicago, where um, you know we spent a week. Uh, meeting children in the hospital. And, and some of them had never left the hospital the first three years of their life. They'd had heart transplants. And they said, can you bring a piece of Chicago into this garden for us? So we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And a, tr a couple trees that were planted by Frederick Law Olmsted during the Columbian Exposition fell. And uh, we worked with an urban forester, and he called me at around 11 and said, some trees just fell, do you want them? And so that's often the beginning of the story is that these materials have a kind of resonance that have meaning for the communities that we work with. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. I actually didn't know that about the trees. <laughs> and isn't there like a hand print? And there is, yeah. so that's, that's an even longer story. So we, <laughs> we, <laughs> we um, decided we wanted to imprint the narrative of the, 
children in this place. And so I went there for three days with a colleague and we waited. So we told um, the hospital, please let everybody know that we want children of all ages. And um, when we got there, there was a line, like we were rock stars. Aww. And there were all these parents, <laughs> mothers in particular, who just wanted their kids to be imprinted in this mm. garden. And so um, we just, we try to find all these different ways to bring meaning that are, it's outside of ourselves in certain ways. Mm. And so it's kind of the mixing of culture and nature. Mm. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm. You know, and actually it's interesting that you mention this idea of systems of the natural world and, um, you know, thinking about nature's own intelligence, if you will, and I think about your work, Neri, and mm -hmm. so much of what you're doing um, with materials and developing processes that enable some of those to be realized. Um, what's your starting point? Tree. <laughs> <laughs> starting point is yeah. the tree. I liked your answer, especially uh, because also for us, and and when you you th you know when you ask about the starting point. Um, the starting point and the end point sort of meet uh, at the same place. I, I would say that for us as well, um, a material is less of a product, more of a process, uh, less about a kind of a final static product or object, um, and more about a system of interactions between physical constraints and environmental constraints. Uh, and once you understand, that's why I also call the, the group mediated matter and not yeah. material, not, not a material-based uh, group, but matter-based group, because matter is so much more gener generically defined, can be so much more generically defined. Um, and so I think of um, the process much, much like I think about um, uh, the question about material and materiality, and it reminds me um, of uh, um, the wasp and the orchid, right? The, mm. the Deleuzian argument about is, is the wasp part of the orchid? Is the orchid part of the wasp? You can't really cut a clean line between the organism and, and the plant because they each define itself. And of course, the wasp carries, uh, in a way, nourishes the reproductive system of the, 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 the orchid and, and carries uh, and enables its pollination, etc. And so there is a continuous um, dependency between elements of a particular system that define matter. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, in our process, um, we don't take um, wood as wood, or we don't define uh, wood, again, as a static, um, highly grained uh, artifact, but rather we start with a tree, and we start with a molecular structure um, of, that, um, of that particular wood, and we think, how can we, rather than cut trees, how can we so reinvent the process of growing wood from scratch? Um, and this is true for work we did with polymers, and it's true for work we did with glass and silica silicate, silicon. It's true for work we did with shrimp shells um, and, and uh, biopolymers. Uh, and so rather than starting with an end product, the starting point is uh, a set of constraints um, and a set of physical characterization of matter. Um, that is being chosen, again, whether it's fibers or cellular solids or, um, again, biopolymers, and then understanding the range of control uh, that we can leverage as designers to tune those physical and environmental properties. I see friends in the audience, not smiling. <laughs> um, uh, as to generate the product, as to generate the final, the final object. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the process and the product are really interwoven. Mm. Uh, and, and I think it's true also for the other. Uh, yeah, <laughs> actually, I was going to say, I mean, the, the, nice the, the yeah. yeah, the process and the product really are interwoven. I mean, thinking, Christina, to you and the way in which you work with material, um, how do you approach material and the process of material in, in your work? You know, I think in my case, yeah. the material has such an intimate relationship with what I do. Yeah. And um, there are two things I think about. One is, how does it feel? Mm. 
because it's something that we wear, and um, I think about that. But then also, it has such a you know, close relationship with our body and nature. I think about where the materials come from. In my case, I mainly work with um, natural materials like cotton, wool, linen, hemp. And I kind of think about the whole, I mean, I kind of dissect it from the seed, from the growing, and then the whole, the, the whole journey that raw material takes, and what kind of impact that, that journey of the material impact makers. So for example, you know, past 20 years, I've been very conscious about using organic cotton because I was working in the fields in India where cotton was growing in organic and conventional. And in the work I do where there, a lot of the work is done by hand and I got to see firsthand the impact of conventional cotton has on spinner's hand. And also it impacted you know, their whole system so, you know, understanding what the raw materials can do, I'm very conscious about choosing my own materials and then trying to support as much of a organically grown uh, materials or not using chemicals or not going through as many processes. I mean, mm. you know, I do, you know, work with very simple basic tools and that um, that word that that's the world I feel very comfortable, and I could relate to the people that I work with in that sense. So it has been very much about the the life of a plant, hmm. and that's what I do, and that's how I start. Yeah. There almost seems to be a reverence <laughs> for materials and the materials that are a part of each of your practices. Um, Neri, I'm curious to have you elaborate and talk about that a little bit more. Um, it's what it means to be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is what it means to be alive, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, can, I can do more of that. Um, yes. Reverence in the sense of respect, mm -hmm. and reverence in the sense of honesty, mm -hmm. and reven reverence in the sense of ingenuity, and reverence in the sense of rigor uh, and sensitivity, yeah. um, and uh, for what the material wants to be. And recently, we've just completed the Agohocha Pavilion, where we're happy to declare that we're designing an, an, another one for you guys <laughs> and um, and you know and there are all these questions around uh, you know how long would it la does it last like uh, uh, the, the previous uh, the previous pavilion was just recently acquired for a major um, museum for a permanent, permanent collection and all these questions came up um, how long would it last it, does it last like a Picasso uh, you know how, how many centuries could we count on it to last? And, and to all these questions we answered we don't know we don't know we don't know and I think I've, I've been to the Pantheon this part past August for the first time in my life and just having experienced this incredibly um, I, you talk about reverence yeah. <laughs> being in the Pantheon yeah. that's like <laughs> that's reverence and just being there and experiencing experiencing culture in nature uh, in a structure that's been built uh, you know that's 3500 years years and more old and is still there and it's still it's it's still standing and signifies you know not only this incredible structure but signifies or embodies the values of of, of a democratic society and then I, and then I thought about our recent structure um, that is designed to you know to to dissociate in a single reign yeah. and what does that mean um, that when, when you can design for decay and when you're not designing, and, and wh when that definition of sustainability switches um, from uh, time to quality, does decay mean 
the, the end of the legacy of that product? Or rather, does the fact that the structure decays and dissociates uh, and nourishes the ground and instead grows another tree means that it lasts longer than the pantheon? It's just a different, uh, I think, a different way of thinking about time yeah. and also about transformation. So I think the most recent um, taste in reverence uh, in the age of global warming, um, and we should talk about global warming, <laughs> um, and, and in the age of all of these uh, environmental havocs that are amongst us, um, this kind of sensitivity to uh, timeless timeliness versus timelessness uh, is extremely important for design and designers. Um, and designers that, um, you know, that are um, all about, you know, designing this perfect static object, we talked about the modernist tradition, yeah. um, uh, w w will not be able to enter the, con the environmental, the conversation right. in the context of the environmental challenges. So I think this, the sense of reverence that you speak of, and that's such a beautiful word, um, has to do with the, the understanding of, of tunability the, and, and the sensitivity and sensibility to the environment uh, across spatial dimensions, of course, but across time yeah. dimensions as well. Yeah, you know, and it is interesting. I mean, as you and I were just talking about, I mean, this idea of mm -hmm. decay, and it really seems to have come out of this modernist tradition, this idea of using materials that almost were impermeable and impervious to nature's fluctuations and rhythms itself, you know, that there was this kind of eschewing of change <laughs> and of decay, you know, whereas now it seems like we're really beginning to turn some of that on its head. And, you know, how do, how do you as designers in your own practice embrace variation, for instance? Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk to that, McYoung? Um, I think to be a landscape architect, you have to be a little irreverent <laughs> because you're, you know, there is this very simplistic notion of, um, when I was a young child, I had the good fortune of meeting Dan Kiley and, um, he kind of said, well, as a landscape architect, you either have the option to be like God and make nature <laughs> or be irreverent. So it's very mm -hmm. funny because he used the same mm -hmm. kind of twist on words. I, I think that for, for us, our work is always about time. Mm -hmm. It's always about, I, I'm not, decay is part of the consideration of what we do, but there's also kind of an accretion, there's, it's things transform and it's not just the natural world because we do a lot of work in the city and we're interested in the kind of interface of culture and the natural world, which is water for us mm -hmm. in the city. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just where is water going? Where is it coming? And how do we manage it? And so, but for, for us, I think, um, as landscape architects, you can't do your job and be too romantic because our job is to try to find how we fix the systems that we're slowly destroying in, our, in, our, in a kind of global way. And how do we do that? Um, some people are thinking about it in the kind of larger realm, in the kind of um, more strategic realm. And then people, designers like us, we're doing it in a more granular level where every project we say, how does it link to something else? And how can we start to create a system mm -hmm. after doing four or five projects in Boston or something? And so. It is a, um, it's kind of uh, reverent because you're trying to understand how nature actually works, but irreverent because you're not trying to emulate the, the form of God because you can, or of the natural world, because I, I don't feel that we can ever beat the beauty of the natural world and the way in which, and then you probably end up making things that are fixed, right? You fall in love with a certain moment and then you replicate that. You know, and it's, again, I feel like there are almost these themes that we kind of keep touching upon. I mean, thinking again, even of like, you know, these systems and moments of of time and processes and, you know, thinking to ideas of where we find ourselves currently <laughs> with climate change um, and the environment and whatnot. And I think a lot actually to your practice, 
Christina and, you know, really embracing all the material, you know, once you have dedicated yourself to something that, um, you know, you find these applications and ways to use every little bit of it. I mean, there's this just beauty in what that practice is, <laughs> which I think would be interesting to think about how that could replicate out. Um, you know, how, um, how does that work for you in your practice as far as just, you know, working with the Jamdani, um, with these beautiful hand-woven textiles and, you know, creating kind of these larger garments down into these tiny amulets? Well, it goes back to reverence for material. Um, and for me, it's a combination of two. Most of the material that I work with are made by hand. But then also, there's a whole layer of making from the fabric that we use hands to make the clothing. And, um, and the, you know, the, I work m mainly in India, in Mexico, where, you know, the, uh, the, the value of our making has a different value system than here. And so that's one of the things that I thought about. So for example, I could create really design heavy work, but it really s lengthens the work of making itself. But because like places like in India, we, you know, our pay schedule, pay rate is different. So I just try to make as much hand design work as possible to extend the life using as little natural material as possible, but just add time value to it. And so that we really don't tap into as much natural resources. And also to create layers of work which where the artisans has to also put a lot of their design thinking because in you know, one of the work that I do is try to create work with the leftover fabrics. And the leftover fabric work involves a lot of ingenious thinking on the maker's part. So through that process, I think you are able to um, create a dialogue with a designer and a maker, which also creates a, some kind of a human relationship, which I think is very important. And through that human exchange between myself and the maker, I think we add a lot of design value to it, which allows us to sell it at higher price. Yeah. So I think, um, I think that all comes from really reverence for the natural material and our hands. Yeah. So how is your process then if you are using materials you can't predict in advance what their shapes are, sizes. Do you draw things in advance or do you? Well, there's a whole process. So what we do is we, let's say, cut 500 meters and we have a, like a pile where we just collect it. And then we just kind of, you know, all of us, myself and the makers, we all kind of get into like a running shoes and we sort the fabric <laughs> by shape and color. And so there's a lot of physical activity, which I think is very interesting, because I also work with a lot of women and men who come from different backgrounds in India. So they could be, you know, Muslims and Hindus, and even in Hindu, there's a whole layer of um, uh, caste system that I deal with. But by making it very physically active, and that we all have to kind of the share this sorting process, it kind of creates a certain amount of equality. Mm -hmm. And it actually is really fun, you know, yeah. because most, most work that is involved in handwork is very sedentary and they don't move. So I think it kind of creates certain amount of new way of thinking that I didn't think about before, mm -hmm. and active. I think it's activating and active. Well, and it speaks to collaboration too. Yes, for sure. I mean, for sure. Yeah, because how does as a designer, I can't. I could only have a certain amount of template, yeah. but it's the makers who have to make a lot of decisions themselves. Mm -hmm. Choice of colors, how do you put it together? Mm -hmm. And I think that really creates a dynamic 
that probably didn't exist before in the kind of work that that I've been doing in mm -hmm. my field. And I think it's nice. I mean, you know, as as you were getting to, I mean, that there is there's not really a predictability necessarily then in what the end product will be and right. being open to what that process and, is. And and we also really, really revere one of a kind. Yeah. Right. So that also adds value. Yeah. Do you find that when you bring those products here to the US that it's different now than it was I, 15 years ago in terms of how the public perceives your work? Very much so. Yeah, what's very, very much so. I think also there's a kind of a movement. People want to make things themselves. So there's a lot of hand making that is happening in, in our time. And I think through that process, people tend to understand things that are made um, by one person from beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of a creative decision making and I, know, I think one could feel it. There's a certain amount of something that you really don't know but you feel something is different. I think that comes from a lot of hand touch. Mm -hmm. I think there's something about our hand that is unique and that energy I think it somehow transmits it. Mm -hmm. You know, and even thinking of the intimacy of materials, I mean in your particular case where the often end as garments worn on the body, <laughs> which is incredibly intimate. Um, and you know, just how all of the materials ultimately pervade our lives and our existence, and sadly our oceans <laughs> uh, at this point. I mean, Neri, what do you think about the role of materials in design and moving forward? I mean, that's the, the whole point behind material ecology yeah. is exactly that. Um, uh, uh, a research area that is dedicated to understanding the principles behind the environmental and the physical properties of materials at large um, to be able to shift, uh, um, I would say, the material world from um, an ecology agnostic domain to one that operates like natural ecology. I mean, if you think about the definition of ecology, Ecology defines the relationships between organisms and other organisms and organisms and then their environment. Uh, if, if you can apply that definition to the world of the artificial, uh, then you can enter a completely different world where everything we design from products, wearables, to buildings, to cities, um, enters that ecology. Um, the, the work we started doing with water-based digital fabrication um, the thesis behind this work is, is that really these robotic processes can eliminate um, the use and application uh, and generation of plastics altogether. And so uh, as, of, as, as of now, there is no use for plastic. Um, there is no reason why we should be uh, continuously producing plastic when we have these other materials and processes that enable us um, you know, to generate this bottle out of a um, out of a, a, a biopolymer that can biodegrade on command um, and can grow into a perfume you know can transform into a perfume bottle or it can transform into a tree or it can tr transform into an edible um, and and so this area of programming matter mm -hmm. um, much in the same way in which we program life and program DNA uh, in, in the, the area of synthetic biology, something that the team and I are very, very interested in, and how can we uh, develop relationships between the program, programming of matter and the programming of life uh, and, and link those two together to, to create together what we call material ecology. And you know, and, and, you know it's, it's a big deal when you can use a robotic arm <laughs> to, to print a six meter structure and control the molecular scale mm -hmm. uh, of, that, of that structure. You can literally control the alignment with crystallinity of, of polymers um, uh, and, and program the chemical behavior of a structure at an architectural stage, uh, uh, scale. Uh, so I think this is a really exciting moment for designers. Yeah. This, this, yeah. 2018, this moment is a very, very exciting moment for design and designers across products, across applications, across disciplines, um, across fields. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 I think, and I think that the ability to enter uh, 
the, the design domains uh, across these various uh, across these various scales, um, you know, not not as gods but as gardeners, uh, is is really really the key, and not to be afraid that you know that, that an architect can operate as a chemist and vice versa. Yeah, well, you know, and it's so interesting too because I mean we find ourselves living in such a fascinating time, right? I mean there really is this convergence with the digital and the biological, which is enabling so much to happen. I mean, we're really just at the beginning of it and understanding what the impacts of this potentially could be and what they look like. And we're really writing all the rules, <laughs> you know, as we're sitting here talking about this. Um, you know, and, and I think so often about it, you know, no longer even just being about a material perhaps making, you know, be, being neutral in its own ecosystem, but how can it actually enhance potentially its host environment? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are, are there any materials in particular that you're exploring yeah, or processes? Right, right behind us, uh, yeah. two images ago. Um, absolutely. Um, uh, polymers that are printed to contain living matter that mm. can interact uh, with the human body by virtue of creating these um, selective filtering membranes uh, that can allow vitamins uh, or vitamin-like fluids uh, to enter the body, to scan the body, um, these already exist. The question is, of course, how to make, how to turn these processes into real-world products, how to get them FDA approved, and you know, this will take a practice, and this is something we're working on as well. Um, but, um, but uh, of course, around fibers, there, there's mm. fascinating research uh, and, and products that are coming into the world, uh, especially one, one great example is a Ford uh, um, link to MIT, uh, the ability to, for example, use um, fibers as preforms, semiconductor preforms that are drawn from uh, very, very tall towers um, from four, four centimeter-ish diameter to micron scale as, you know, as lasers. Um, fibers that can, can conduct sound, can conduct light, uh, can act as medical devices, um, and can be organically potentially organically formed. Uh, and so that, that kind of interaction, <laughs> the ability to, I, I would say, to mediate between the natural environment, the biological environment, um, the natural environment, the biological environment, uh, uh, and, and the designed environment um, is, is one that, that is extremely, extremely important. The ability to sort of be able to translate these three currencies, the digital, the biological, and the physical. Um, is is one that is is a uh, is a literacy yeah. is a literacy without which we we can't we can't uh, enter the next century. Yeah, we can't afford well, to let's say. Right. Well, and it's so interesting because I mean you know we we still are living a bit with the legacy of industrial production and a bit of the logic of what that was, right? And you know standardization and, and romanticism. And the pantheon. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You know, and, and thinking about like that logic of standardization and, um, you know, and stamping out, I, you know, identicality and whatnot. And it's so interesting that I think in a way in each of your, your own practices, as diverse and divergent as they are, in many ways actually touches upon all of that. I mean, thinking, Christina, to, you know, the fact that there is variation in each and every piece ultimately because of the maker, because of the... We are varied, yes, right? Exactly. We ourselves exactly. are. So, yeah. Right. I, I think it's interesting uh, as hearing both of these kind of different processes, how it's occurring to me, I'm going to say it for the first time, so it might not make sense, um, that designers are almost mediators right now. They have all these choices to that it's economically viable to create things that are handmade, uh, completely made by hand. And then there is this other there's this other end of the spectrum where we have this incredible technology that allows for us that machines can make things that are at incredible scales, at the scales of buildings. Um, yeah. And so I think it's really interesting that as designers we have a choice. And we sometimes we start off as young designers um, defined by the school we went to. <laughs> and the school chooses for us what's important. And then we all, as individuals, we go out there and we start to um, embed ourselves in, in whatever we're interested in. We find our soul in wherever we're going. And um, I think it's, so I was thinking about what you were talking about and 
for us because there's a kind of, there is a moment where we cut the ribbon and we say, we pass the project to a public. Um, but we do try to find that narrative. There's a project we did in Korea where, um, and a lot of our stories are not known, um, where the story was that this source point was the place where North and South Korea would celebrate when they reunited. And that was 1992. We're still having that discussion today. But um, what we did was we found quarries in the nine provinces of North and South Korea, and we reached out to them and asked them to donate stone. And so there are nine source points to the Seven Mile River, and they all, so there's a story about coming together, and mm -hmm. but it's also a story about just bringing people to the water. And so, but I don't know if people can, s there isn't a kind of, each stone came and it was unique, and we had to design it once we saw the piece and it was fabricated and sold. But it, it sounds like it's a little different from your process where um, it's more immediate, you know. Well, there's a certain amount of template that we follow. So, for example, you know, we do have graded patterns, and, you know, certain fabrics have a certain different requirements. But once that has been achieved, um, artisans could put their signature into it. So it does become quite unique, and especially in the projects that we do where we use scraps. So, yeah. I mean, I guess that's the question I want to ask you, Neri, is that because a lot of things you do have a kind of mathematical and uh, computer-based science foundation, um, how do you integrate, because in the end, the, the things that you make feel very organic and very hu humane, and what's that process? Like, how does it differ from Christina, where she starts with her hands, but you s it seems yours starts with a more intellectual process and then moves through? Mm. I, I think it's the same, honestly. Uh -huh. Um, I think uh, in the play, in the mo innovation is sort of the moment where uh, the hand and the and 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 the machine unite. I think I think it's the same. Mm. Um, I think it's the aesthetic aesthetics of thinking mm -hmm. that defines the 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 physical aesthetics. It's, but it doesn't start with the physical aesthetics. It starts with an intellectual aesthetics, with a, a taste in thinking um, that, that defines the process. Uh, yes, the, the are, there are folks on my team that compare the elegance of code you know, to, to the form of, the elegance of computer code or the elegance of, 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 uh, um, of uh, um, DNA code. Um, to, to the elegance of the, the final product, whether a, 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 a um, organic object, a non-organic object, or a living being, a living organism. Uh, but, but I think in, in the end, um, in the end, it, it's it's sort of here. It's a, it's a philosophy that defines uh, th that defines the process that sort of calls calls upon the tools. But mm. in, on the other hand. It's not. <laughs> like on the other hand, we do spend a long time being hard on each other. And, and um, is, it? is it in that kind of granule? It's in the pasta. We have to cook a ton to just be around <laughs> food and around each other. But we give each other a hard time until we get to that it's super magical uh, 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 point where. But is it in the coding then that you do it's that? It's everything. So it's do you code it and then you print it and then you try it again? Yeah, yeah. What's so, okay, so here, here's the, the, the less romantic, uh, more scientific explanation. Um, <laughs> so the vis-a-vis uh, -vis the industrial revolution yeah. and, the, and the modernist tradition and serialization and serialization on command. Um, currently, there, there is, is what we call a, a dimensional mismatch between the built environment and the biological environment. Uh, I said the built environment, the biological environment, and the natural environment. That dimensional mismatch is, uh, for example, 
uh, expressed in how um, our skins uh, respond to heat versus how concrete responds to heat um, on the scale of a skyscraper versus the scale of a body. And so there is what we call a dimensional mismatch, okay? So now, if we as designers can reduce or perhaps eliminate that dim dimensional mismatch, mm -hmm. and this does not have, uh, it, 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 of course it has to do with granularity and resolution, but not only, it also has to do with complexity. If we can reduce or eliminate that dimensional mismatch, then we enter material ecology. Then we enter an age where you will not be able to separate between the natural and the artificial. Mm -hmm. This age is coming. Uh, that, that age requires, that ability that I, I call this material singularity. To, to arrive at a material singularity would require of us to eliminate completely the dimensional mismatch between those three environments, the built environment, the, 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 the natural environment, the biological environment. Uh, th that, of course, will generate a new form of, of species. It will affect how we evolve. It will affect how we live. It will affect how we interact with each other and with our environments. Um, so, so what we try to do is get there. Uh, we're not there, we haven't eliminated that dimensional mismatch, but um, projects that we do, that do touch, touch that, um, that uh, uh, ambition, uh, carry that aesthetics. And Vespers is a good example, the, 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 the collection of death masks we re recently uh, published um, and, and, and exhibited um, that the, the, the death mask becomes a life mask, right? It is designed at the resolution of the last breath of the wearer. It is designed at the resolution of potentially stem cells. It is des designed uh, uh, to, uh, to um, contain and operate uh, at the level of an E. coli cell that can produce pigments, antibiotics, pigments on com uh, melanin on command. Um, and so once you get there, uh, not only the functionality of the product surprises you um, and uh, is not there to serve the human body or to serve the environment, but rather there's this beautiful marriage, this beautiful relationship between the two, um, but also you've entered a new, uh, this kind of aesthetics that you're talking about. So, so that's what we try, that's, what we, that's where, so always trying to push the team Right. In every, the team is divided into different projects. Each project tackles a different material system. For each material system, we aim to reduce that dimensional mismatch between the three domains. Okay, and that's, so that's basically the secret of my so group. So when you say... I shared everything. I've never <laughs> said that. Actually, in a panel, that's it. Publish. Yeah. <laughs> so when you say the dimensional mismatch, because you're going to have to come two levels down for me, yeah. you... Um, <laughs> And that's a compliment. <laughs> um, yeah. So you said, so when you said skin to concrete, I got it, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so where are you going? So with think that? about glass and leaf, or right? The, the, well, the let's photosynthesis. Skin, and so I understand skin and concrete. Skin is flexible; it yeah. can clo open and close. Concrete it has some, but it's not, and so it cracks. Right. And so for me, it's like a, it's a huge problem. And right, so right, is that right. the direction that things are moving in? That. Yeah, that so the exactly. materials yeah. have yeah. mimic yeah. the yeah. things that are so amazing. Not mimic, not mimic, okay. cannot stand this word. Okay. <laughs> not mimic, but, um, but, but, um, but uh, perhaps, um, perhaps um, uh, arrive to a spatial and temporal uh, gradation. The ability to spatially, let's say, spatially vary the porosity of concrete on demand based on load conditions. Mm -hmm. We'll get it closer to you know, what, what the calcellus, um, uh, um, spongy bone, how the spongy bone reacts to, to load. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can do that in the time dimension as well, yeah. then, you've, then sort of you've reached the holy grail. And so it's the be very rich if you figure that out. I don't know if rich. <laughs> Uh, we're not there yet. Yeah. Still eating white rice, <laughs> but um, but uh, but it's um, look. You know, I, I I said this before, right? We we could be we could be printing Coca Cola bottles from printed glass, but that's not the point, right? The the point is to use those technologies to do good mm -hmm. for and with the environment, and just takes a little bit more time. Um, but but the secret really is in uh, being able to, we talked about tunability, gradation, yeah. variation, to tune not only the physical properties of, of, of the structure, so in, in the sense of concrete porosity, mm -hmm. in, in the sense of skin uh, elasticity, 
um, uh, opacity in, in, in uh, uh, strength or, or um, in, in the context of clothing, um, but also the temporal behavior, the time-based dimension, and how these material, materials and buildings and products and marbles and cities change over time, like the seasons. And now with weather engineering, that, I mean, add weather engineering to this and add like the geoscience and add all of these new innovations around um, around the, um, the the overall not only contamination but also possibility of designing climate. Uh, you you have something very very powerful, scary and ethically questionable, but very powerful also. Yeah, and actually. Um before we open it up to all of you, I have one more question too, actually related to aesthetics and you know thinking around. I'm just thinking of even like a, a, a visual language, right? You know, and and how do we develop even a new vocabulary and mindset for consumers around contemplating new materials? You know, because all of this is 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 really different the way in which we might even anticipate using them. You know, thinking about a water bottle that you know potentially will degrade and we could eat and <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I mean i mean i mean google the right of Sp stravinsky talking about the right of spring when he wrote that at the time he wrote the right of spring yeah you know major musical piece right that changed the face of music forever yeah um and, and just look at, at the, the apartment building in the room where he sat and wrote this piece and, and how many years he suffered uh, be before before people could actually understand what it did to to music and musical perception, the understanding of music, and so language takes time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it just takes time, and 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 I'm sure we've all been faced with, you know, I mean, at least I've been told, are you guys too smart to build? What's going on? Why can't you? you know, why? It takes time. And when yeah. you start from the technology, and you don't start with a product. You start. Yeah. As you say, with a seed, you start yeah. with a seed. As Christina says so beautifully, uh, you start with the very, very, very the, the origin point, the 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 you know this tiny little seed um, that is designed, programmed, codified to grow. Uh, it just it just takes more time, and and there is a whole system of ethics and aesthetics mm -hmm. and uh, communication. How how do we talk about structures that are designed for decay on command? at the resolution of the human breath uh, um, in the context of flu. I mean, how does this relate to hospitalization? How does this relate to the medical environment? Uh, so I think it's just, it will just take time, but it's, yeah. it's, I mean, it's already here. Um, it's a completely different, different era than, than the one, you know, the, the one that's been given to us or inherited to us through, from modernism, postmodern tradition. I will open it up to the audience. Does anyone have a question for our panelists and award winners? Yes? Yeah. Hi, for Christina, I guess, right? A question I have for you is, you mentioned the, the um, how, it, how the cotton that's not organic affects the, the people that are actually weaving it. Could you describe that a little bit more? Is it just, I, I'm curious as to what does it actually do? I'm very curious. <clears throat> the chemicals from the uh, sprays that they spray, it, oh, I'm sorry guys, it's really sad. It kind of almost eats the skin and their hands kind of look like the people who has had, um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying. Leprosy. Leprosy, yeah, and, and I've worked in leprosy colonies, so I know what their hands look like. And there's very similar um, kind of a physical deformation that happens. But you could also see when they're breathing, the sound of the breathing is a little bit different. And, and, and also it probably has something to do with the diet. You know, they're not, the, the, you know, the spinning job is not very well paid. So it's probably a combination of many things. But that's physically very visible when you see them. Hi. Oh, that's really loud. Thank you so much. Um, I'm kind of curious about Mick Young specifically about this idea of sort of 
materials, the material singularity, i.e. the materials, sort of one kind of material being able to adopt the characteristics of another kind of material. And it feels like the value of materials being unique unto themselves, specifically in a landscape setting, and, and that I, I appreciate the idea of the, that materials could become more flexible, but I think if we think back to kind of the idea of reverence, that part of what, at least for me, makes me revere something is its unique and specific nature. And so what I'm wondering is sort of if we're thinking on the one hand about moving towards a space where maybe those natures can be blended or there's more flexibility, like how, how, does, how does that relate to you in the context of the natural systems that you were talking about? That's interesting. We should talk more after this. I think um, like what, what I said earlier about how we're managing nature and technology, um, it's, a, it's a constant calibration that you do as a landscape architect. There are some contexts where it makes sense to actually use a lot of technology and press the material to its limits. And there are reasons why. Sometimes it's human need. Um, a lot of clinical projects, healing gardens that we work on, they require for us to find materials. A lot of natural materials actually are uh, absorb germs in a way that are very harmful for um, very fragile patients. Um, but then there are times when you are working within a kind of larger stream. You're working within a larger system, and you're trying to show a reverence for that. We do a lot of work in the city, and we often come to a site that is um, very difficult, it is unpopular, it's not used, it's quite harsh, and the questions are more cultural, um, the questions that our clients ask us, rather than, and we're the ones who bring the kind of resiliency piece, we're the ones who demand, you, you must address the kind of systems that go through your site. Um, but I think it's a range, and I think within our profession, there's a desire to kind of try to fix that, which I find quite peculiar, because we work as landscape architects on so many different kinds of sites, like we can work on a restoration of a riverfront, we can work on um, a botanic gardens in Charlottesville, Virginia, in a town which um, has become known for these kind of political marches. We can... Um, at the same time, we're developing tableware for Swarovski crystals. And so I think for landscape architects, as Neri said earlier, there's no better time to be a designer. And the more you can stretch your creative muscles and do many different things and show your own kind of creative resiliency, the more interesting your practice is. We have a question in the back. I guess the, the term ethics came up uh, from a couple of you, and I guess this is always an issue with technology, that you can do things, you can make things happen, and the ethical tends to lag behind, sometimes way behind. What I'm hearing, particularly in the way the term reverence has been circulating among you, how do you, in your various practices, try to keep the technology and the ethics at least running closer together in your projects? You should, I, should, I should take this. I always shoot myself in the foot. I, it's know, so I, I always ready. get this. No, you know, you would think that I have the answer ready. <laughs> you would think, right? Yeah. But I don't. Okay. I really, really don't because I, there's no one day that goes by that I don't learn something new. And I will not go to sleep until I've learned something new. And, and so it's just, just how, how we're, we're wired on the team. And that also means you know, that y you get exposed to the, the good and the bad. I mean, right? The, the, the copy printer and the, the communist, uh, the birth of communism. Um, you know, to, uh, the, the, the ability to 3D print guns and gun, c gun control. Uh, uh, controversy and, and discussions around um, uh, how to how to control and eliminate um, these these terrible shootings uh, uh, in in an age where we can print 
um, we can print guns. Uh, does this mean we stop doing research around 3D printing? No, it just means that um, uh, we foster conversation. Um, we invite uh, people to the team. And I've, most recently, I've been thinking about um, uh, actually formulating a new position in mediated matter for an, an, um, an uh, sort of an ethics slash philosopher that could, could just live with us, uh, see the work that we're doing, and, and, um, and help us sort of direct uh, the right conversations. Um, thankfully, uh, you know, we are based at MIT. Uh, MIT's health and environment is upon us with every um, procedure that we take on at the wet lab. Um, we go through MIT health and environment. So we discuss all the repercussions across scales uh, from the organism to, uh, to the human body to the built environment. And of course, for things that uh, have not been FDA approved and, uh, and, uh, and will have um, impact uh, on society at large. Obviously, they don't, uh, they, they do not leave the, uh, the, the wet lab. Um, a good example is Vespers recently in London, uh, where, you know, where we couldn't get the, the, the microorganisms, the uh, uh, synthetically engineered microorganisms through Heathrow. <laughs> and so we just kept the pigments and bleached the, the E. coli. Um, uh, so, 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 so there, there's a system of um, control, uh, much like there's a system for controlling and tuning innovation. There's also a system for controlling and tuning uh, the ethical implications around this innovation. And part of my roles, or at least the roles I see myself um, uh, responsible for, is to foster and nourish and enable a healthy discussion around those topics. Most recently. Uh, we've realized, um, just as an example, to make things even a bit more provocative, um, uh, so, let's say thought-provoking, we've uh, uh, realized that you know that that we can um, synthetically engineer melanin, the, the 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 pigment that gives our skin its color, um, and um, and you know, and we, we're finding melanin in all the kingdoms of life, the the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom. Archaea, bacteria, it's just an incredible uh, material. It's an incredible material that um, is, uh, is, is, is biologically and mechanically so superior, and yet societ societally uh, so destructive. I mean, right, if you think about the symbolism around melanin and, 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 and slavery and racism and all, all these... these um, you know, difficult and challenging issues that revolve around a material and the sensitivity around it. Uh, you know, what, what do you do in the face of the ability of enablement, uh, of, of using that material, of tuning its, tuning skin color on the fly um, in order to harness or enable uh, a healthier life, a healthier skin, a healthier set of organs? Uh, and and what, what are the systems of cost um, that that are a part of such 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 research, um, really really important question you've asked, um, and one that uh, is now taking my team specifically from 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 territory that's been pretty much charted because we've we haven't entered the 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 work so far has been culturally agnostic. I mean, taking shrimp shells. And grinding them and producing products that are, you know, that replace plastics and, and do good. This is sort of a no-brainer, but, you know, but entering that territory is is um, is is charged. Um, it's it's scary. It's exciting. It's multi-dimensional. And one thing that I've learned is there is no way to reduce. The, the 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 set of complexity around such issues to to an axiom, uh, and and if you're looking to reduce it to a single statement, th then you're probably you know you probably don't belong in that kind of search, uh, because one of one of the things we need to do uh, surrounding uh, you know conversations around ethics around technology is just be able to contain the complexity and hold it and look at it and you know and the, and then apply good judgment. Uh, in, in the face of uh, the embodiments in the product. So very, very complex um, and very interesting 
and, and, and potentially exciting um, uh, work around this area, and thank you for bringing it up. And I yeah. think that we could really have an entire yeah, that's right. panel. Can I just add one <laughs> thing to that? So I think that's a brilliant um, answer to the question. There's a second component, which is for, I assume a lot of people in the room are designers. It's um, uh, technology has influenced the process of design. And so it's really, as Neri said, it's paying attention um, because you have more and more tools, and there are certain schools of thought which says you should just allow technology to basically, to you punch a button and then it just does it. And then there are, and then I think there's a kind of um, uh, a kind of backlash of trying to say, well, we're human and we make things with our hands. And I think to be able to, I think we are human. We, when we converse with different people, when I converse with my four-year-old niece and I converse with Neri and then I converse with um, the person in my hotel, I use different voices. And I think that as designers, we just have to embrace the range of tools, not be afraid of them, but also be skeptical and, be, and make sure that we don't... Um, technology our way <laughs> out of our scope, you know, because I was yeah. uh, last year I was driving. So we'll end up with singularity. We'll end up <laughs> with singularity. Not in our Not in our That's coast. right. And, <laughs> you know, like AutoCAD is developing a system where uh, they can develop a hundred options for the facade design of a high-rise tower in an hour. And I could just see some of the developers that I know really loving yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> and the danger of that, or the kind of grasshopper, like the, the people who say, in my profession, in, in landscape architecture, say mm -hmm. uh, that you collect all the data about the site, and then you input it into a machine, and that software, whether it's grasshopper or or other kinds of uh, data-driven software will yield you a design, I have to say, that is ethically questionable. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, so it's just to be very careful, you yeah. say, where is that line, and to constantly pay attention to it. And I, I, I want us to say one more thing. I think women are really great <laughs> at paying attention to that line. So that's why you see, yeah. I think, three All women, women on there. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a fantastic place to sadly end our conversation, which I think could go on and on. But of course, we do invite you uh, to continue the conversation, material futures, ethical implications, designer's role in all of this uh, upstairs in the Great Hall for our networking event. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.